<laughs> no, not yet. Um, I, I know I'm still working through some of my things as well. Uh, welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. And as usual, I want to stop here and welcome our guests because I know there are a couple of things that are very precious. And one is that their time is a valuable commodity. And I am honored that this person is here to share that with us today as well as his journey, because housed within that is much wisdom and the things and the tools that you and I will learn so that we become better human spirits here on this planet. Dr. Maul, thank you for coming to Threads of Enlightenment, sir. Thank you. Welcome. My pleasure, Ken. Thank you very much for having me. It is an honor, sir. Go ahead and tell them what you have created. I know you have your book, Radical Responsibility, and much more, um, and uh, your mindfulness and uh, your meditation practice. You tell them everything that you have, and then we will take the journey as we usually do here at President Lightning. Okay, all right, Ken. Well, I'll, I'll try to be succinct about it because I, I do kind of, I'm pretty spread out. I do a lot of different things. But um, <laughs> I know. Fundamentally, I'm uh, I'm a meditation teacher. Uh, I've been practicing uh, mindfulness and awareness meditation in various styles uh, in the Tibetan Buddhist, Zen Buddhist, and Vipassana traditions, as well as within the secular mindfulness tradition, for more than fifty years now, and been teaching probably for about forty-five years. Uh, so that's a big part of my life. Um, I'm also a mindset teacher and mindset coach, and that ties into my book, Radical Responsibility. And we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Um, so, yes. um, and we'll talk about my background, but uh, as you're aware, I did spend uh, a number of years in prison on drug charges. And, uh, you know, I had mm -hmm. a whole kind of journey that came through the counterculture and so forth. But as a result of that time in prison, I got very involved in bringing meditation and mindfulness and other personal evolution tools uh, to other prisoners and to the whole world of at-risk, incarcerated, and returning uh, adult and youth citizens. And and then in oh, the last 14 years, gotten very involved in, in bringing those same tools to the correctional officers, to the probation and parole officers, and to police and fire rescue and uh, other first responders. And... Uh, so all that happens under a nonprofit I started many years while I was in prison called Prison Dharma Network, and it has different divisions. There's Prison Mindfulness Institute, which is really about all the work with at-risk incarcerated returning adults and youth. And then there's the Center for Mindfulness and Public Safety, which is all of our work with public safety professionals, first responders. Uh, then there's the Engage Mindfulness Institute, where we train mindfulness teachers in trauma-informed approaches to sharing the practice of mindfulness. And our niche is really training people to work with individuals who've been placed at risk, uh, communities that have been marginalized and under-resourced, and so forth, places where there's a lot of pain and trauma. And so we train mindfulness teachers to work in those areas. And and um, so that's all happening under the under the nonprofit. Um, and, uh, and then I have my, my, you know, all my meditation teaching that I do through various vehicles around the world. And uh, and then I have uh, my own company called HeartMind Institute. And HeartMind Institute, I offer online courses, uh, a radical responsibility course, a seven principles of mindfulness, of mindful leadership course, uh, neurosomatic mindfulness, which is my particular kind of style of, of mindfulness practice and teaching that I've developed over the years, a deeply embodied trauma-informed, neuroscience-informed approach to the practice of mindfulness. So I have several courses there online. and. And, and other courses, a lot of focus on resilience. We say at HeartMind Institute that our, our mission is, uh, to help everyone, ourselves and others become more deeply embodied, more heart connected, more resilient and more, uh, more heart, uh, more heart centered, more resilient and more earth connected. And so we offer a lot of, you know, different courses and programs. I used to do a lot of live stuff. I was a road warrior before the pandemic. I lived on the road. I was, sometimes offering trainings as many as 250 days a year all around the world. And like most people, I, I'm now mm. doing everything online. Uh, and um, uh, then we do our summits. That's a big part of what I do today. We put on big online summits. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'm involved. Uh, I've been involved in in hosting summits and helping others organize summits for about 12 years. But I did my 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 first summit myself, Global Resilience Summit, back in March of 2020, just as the lockdowns were unfolding with the with the pandemic. And I just had this vision that we really needed to focus on resilience. And so in five weeks, my wife and my business partner and I put together the Global Re- Resilience Summit. We enrolled about 35,000 people and it was a big success. And that kind of got us into the summit business. And so now we put on about five summits a year and we're building more all the time. We have a big summit in January every year called the Best Year of Your Life, which is a, a meant to be an antidote or, or an alternative to the proven failure of New Year's resolutions. Uh, we have we have some mm-hmm. pretty clear ideas why New Year's resolutions don't work. Uh, one, uh, people don't get clear enough about their life vision and purpose and don't align their, align their goals sufficiently with that. Uh, often, uh, uh, we don't understand enough about the science of, of habit, habit change and how to create positive habits and how to move forward with our commitments. And also, we often set these New Year's resolutions out of a place of unworthiness. And all our work is grounded in the strong experiential belief I have in the innate unconditional goodness of my own and others, all of humanity, all of life. So coming from that place of unconditional worthiness, it makes a lot of difference. So anyway, we have this big 10 day summit uh, every January. Uh, the third one will be this coming January. And uh, last January, we had 65,000 people. We hope to have 100,000 people this coming January. Wow. And uh, so we're doing we're doing did a summit on self care recently. We did a summit for first responders, the Global Resilience Summit. We're getting ready to do a summit in the emerging psychedelic assisted therapy uh, movement. And so that's a big part of what I do today. Mm -hmm. And and we're able to reach, uh, you know, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people. And like you, I get to interview all these incredible people that we have on our summits. And And that's really a great joy. Uh, that I, for a big joy in my life today. And I live in Western Massachusetts with my wife, Sophie, and uh, feel very blessed to, have, to be able to have the life that I have today. I love uh, what you have set out for for this conversation, Doc, because it houses so much in your work, the body of work that you have done. Um, I want to go back a little because uh, my, uh, I tell my audience, it doesn't matter the status that one achieves in life. We are all here to have this human experience and we are going through our personal journey and we gain insight. And I call those insight, uh, our policies and procedures that we develop as individual that we are able to then, um, learn and, and bring in a format where we can teach people so that they can apply and do the same and change their life. I want you to go back down and talk about your childhood. Introduce us to this young man in his family upbringing. Um, I call it once in a while, the lab where we have these scientists, our wonderful parents that brought us out and into this space through love. And they are now embarking on uh, imparting their wisdom and their knowledge based from their point of view. Talk to us a little about your childhood as a young man coming up. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So I grew up in the Midwest uh, in the United States in a, a middle class Roman Catholic family, a good family. Uh, and I'm, I have a lot of gratitude uh, for my parents and, you know, everything they did for me and, and the good values I received from them that were modeled for me. Uh, at the same time, uh, we had an issue with alcoholism in our family. And uh, my mother, who was an incredible human being and an incredible artist, and and uh, you know she was a stay-at-home mom and an artist, and and really a wonderful mom uh, most of the time. Uh, but sometimes once a week or every other week, she would drink and turn into this very scary rageaholic person. It was like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. And, uh, you know, you'd come home from school and you'd realize mom had been drinking. And, and then it was, you know, pretty soon it was chaos and, uh, you know, chaos over dinner and, you know, chaos with between her and my father. And then eventually, you know, she'd kind of pass out, uh, at night. And, uh, and then we'd all get up for breakfast in the morning. And there she was smiling mom making breakfast like nothing ever happened. And this was never talked about mm. in our family. So it creates a tremendous kind of splitting in your psyche. 
And also when my father wasn't around, my brother was six years older than I was. So he was off to school and then off to college uh, long before I was. And when my father was away on business or I had a business meeting or something and my mother got drunk, then she'd come after me. And uh, so hmm. uh, and one, I actually had to make a boundary with her when I was about, uh, I don't know, 11 or 12. I suddenly, you know, realized I didn't have to take this. And I actually threatened my mom, said if she ever touched me again, I'd kick her ass, you know, and that's a terrible thing to have to say to your mom. Mm -hmm. But and I also lost faith yeah. in my dad because he never dealt with this. Um, and yeah. so, uh, you know, again, I received a lot of good from my family, but we had this problem. And um, so, you know, coming into my adolescence, you know, and then graduating from high school, I was kind of a classic angry young man with a big hole in my gut and uh and mm -hmm. you know this was 1968 one of the most tumultuous years in u.s history with all the assassinations the kent state killings i mean yeah. uh you know there yeah. were racial riots happening in many cities including where i grew up there had been for years since 65 and so it was a very tumultuous time and you know i was just angry and and i was already you know leaning into the counterculture pretty heavily i started doing lsd and and experimenting with other drugs even in high school in 1966. And so I, I graduated from high school and then went, you know, went off to a big state university, but basically went headlong into the counterculture, uh, radical, poli you know, anti-war politics and, and drug experimentation. Yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and that just got darker and darker. I got became an IV drug user. Um, and, you know, I was just kind of rejecting that whole culture that my World War II depression era generation parents had presented as the way. And like a lot of my mm -hmm. contemporaries, we just threw the rule book out and rejected the whole thing. And then, of course, we were making a lot of mistakes and creating big messes. But I was just clear I wasn't going back. I was always going for it. I couldn't go back to that life uh, that I've been presented. And I developed a pretty strong us versus them Kind of thing, which uh, fortunately I moved beyond at some point in my life. But back then, I had this real thought that there were, mm -hmm. you know, I'd lost faith in the culture. Uh, even when when the first Kennedy assassination happened, when I was still in grade school, I just stopped believing in what I was being told. And so uh, I'd lost faith in the culture and very alienated. Uh, I remember reading "Bury My Heart in Wounded Knee," which chronicles all the destruction of the Native American peoples with the English, the Anglo's coming yeah. from the east, and the, the Spaniards coming from the west, and and, you know, I got to some point where I, 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 I just I couldn't even handle being a white person. You know, I was just I felt like, you know, my whole heritage. And and so I was very alienated. And, and eventually I left the country just to get away from the hard drug scene and and uh, just to find something meaningful, to find something real. And somehow I thought I would find that in South America. And uh, I took off traveling mm -hmm. and I, it was an, ama an amazing journey. Uh, unfortunately, drugs were still there in the background, although not the primary focus at all. It was mostly about exploring indigenous culture and the archaeology and, and, you know, just, you know, just getting out and, and seeing a different view of the world. And, uh, but eventually I smelled the fall, small scale drug smuggling to just live outside the system. And I continue to justify yeah. that with all this us versus thinking, you know, thinking, you know, I was, me and my compatriots, you know, were honest and, and the world was completely hypocritical, right? You know, and so, I justified mm -hmm. this criminal behavior and criminal attitude, right? And so, but that was kind of the journey. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, I was always a spiritual seeker. My parents, uh, my family, the kind of family, it wasn't really a joke, but there was a family kind of thing that I was going to become a priest or something because I was the one that seemed the most religiously and spiritually oriented, right? But then, of course, yeah. with the whole yeah. counterculture, mm -hmm. I went and I had completely lost faith in, in the Roman Catholic tradition as well. I, I, I don't know if I really ever had a strong faith. I remember in kindergarten listening to the catechismal, you know, teachings in my religious classes and I'm just going, what? You know, I, I just didn't, I connected with the mass back then, the pre-Vatican II mass, because it had a certain level of mysticism and, and awe and magic. I connected yeah. with that. I was even an altar boy, but I, I didn't really have a faith. I didn't believe in it. And uh, today I'm a great lover of all the great religious traditions and see the universality of that. But but back then I couldn't connect with it. So, you know, I was adrift. I was alienated from, from my parents' culture, from the bigger culture, from my religious culture. And, and so, you know, I was just out trying to, to find my own way. And I made, made a, made a heck of a lot of mistakes, but I was always moving forward. I always knew I wasn't going back. I was going to find my way forward. And there was a through line of a, of a deep kind of spiritual yearning and spiritual longing. 
Yeah, I want to get on in into that because I know some of the bad boys, as they call us, because I was one of those. Um, uh, some of us have this spiritual lining, this undertone that it sits there, and um, it kept me, Doc. It kept me from going what we call uh, several of my friends totally going into the dark side. And there were times that I we would have conversation about where we were located according to our compass and that we weren't there yet, but we were pretty close. Uh, but we had this on the line. And talk to me about that. Where did you think you got it from? I know you didn't from the church when you your family noticed it, but where did you think you got it from? that undertone um, as far as that yeah. spiritual piece? Well, that's an interesting question, Ken. Um, you know, I agree with you. You know, I, I certainly danced around the edges of the dark side. I always had a compass towards goodness, even though I had a lot of confusion and actually yeah. did a lot of harmful things, not so much intentionally, you know, but I had a compass towards goodness and, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, kindness and, and fairness and things like that. But, um, but I certainly danced around the dark side, mostly out of a kind of hedonistic, you know, hedonistic and rebellious and just trying to fill that hole in my gut with everything I could, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll experiences. Yep. Right. Cause I was just, I was just in pain and I hadn't figured out how to actually deal with all that yep. pain. So, but in terms of the roots yes. of that, I don't know, you know, again, I think my family uh, was a good family with good values. And, um, but I, I don't know, I, you know, who know in the Buddhist tradition that I practice in, we have the sense of multiple lifetimes and we come into this life with karma yep. from past lives. And, that's as best as I can think, you know, that that I've been on this journey for a long time. I mean, on some level, I think we've all been on the journey for a long time. Now, where we are and how conscious we are about mm -hmm. that in any given lifetime. But, you know, I feel like I've been on this journey for a long time. When I finally met my first spiritual teacher, I think I probably probably have even maybe had lifetimes of involvement with him. I mean, I can't prove such things and who knows, but it makes more sense out of things yeah, than any yeah. other than any other view I, I can take. And uh so at any rate, I think I probably came into this life with something. And, uh, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my father was relatively secular, although he converted to Catholicism later in life, late, when I was like a t late mm -hmm. teenager. My grandfather converted to Catholicism when I was young and he was very devout. But my mother was always very devout. I mean, uh, she was, she prayed. She was always praying for everybody. Uh, so, you yeah. know, there, there was a bit of that, you know, certain kind of religious spirituality influence uh, in my early childhood, although I kind of rejected the theology of it. But I think there was some some yeah. uh, exposure to some notion that there's more than just this material world. Right. Um, and that, that was very yeah, clear. I yeah. grew up in a culture where there was a recognition that that there was more than just materialism. So I think that helped. So maybe some combination of that and who knows whatever we come into this life with. Yeah, because I. I... In my conversation with people, and especially the ones that uh, society would classify as the bad boys and the bad girls, I find that that common thread is right sitting with inside that individual, way deep in there, Doc, because I feel that most of us, that's the piece that pulls us back into the spiritual aspect and begin to question and ask, what is more there that I want to find out and get there. So talk to me. You are doing all of these uh, movement. You're learning. You're experiencing because the society at that time was ripe in many different forms to give birth to uh, all of the different things which took place, and it did. Um, and you were right in the mix of all of that. Once you moved and you got exposed to a different culture, um, Talk to me about some of those interactions with the different culture, the different um, belief that you were exposed to within that framework, and how did it start to penetrate your personhood, your, your personality, and your belief uh -huh. system? Yeah, well, when I started traveling in Latin America, um, uh, you know, where I grew up in, in the Midwest wasn't a hotbed for, you know, spirituality and the counterculture and everything. I mean, it was there, but it's nothing like being in California or on the East Coast, right? So, uh, but as mm -hmm. I started traveling and meeting other travelers, other kind of backpackers on the road like me, 
uh, you know, shared a lot of interest in, in, you know, in spiritual seeking and, and, you know, we're reading a lot of the same books, uh, reading, you know, Ram Dass's book, Be Here Now, which was a big door opener for a lot of people yep. back in that era. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, the autobiography of a yogi, Paramanasa, uh, Yogananda's book, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of, we're all reading the Castaneda books back then, the Carlos Castaneda books, you know, we're all kind of reading the same books and all yeah. kind of interested in this, you know, bigger, broader spiritual view. Uh, in terms of that was kind of within the culture of the travelers, the backpackers. And then in terms mm-hmm. of the um, local, uh, I mean, you know, the people I was meeting, uh, one, I was just really fascinated with indigenous culture. And but not so much. I, I wish I had, had more training as an anthropologist or something like that. And I uh, had gotten more directly involved with the extant indigenous culture in terms of really trying to understand it. But I was kind of more interested in the ancient culture and then really, you know, visiting the ruins all throughout South Central America and South yeah. America and, and, you know, having my own speculations and reading about, uh, you know, those kind of things. And, um, but once I kind of settled in, uh, I lived for quite a long time in Peru and there I lived out in the mountains in the country and I mm-hmm. spent a lot of time with you know, native people. Um, uh, you know, I was farming a little piece of land and we would communally farm. We'd go around and help plant each other's fields and help harvest each other's fields. And I'd hang out with them. But, you know, there wasn't a lot mm-hmm. of shared language. I learned a little bit of Quechua, the, the ancient Incan language, and they learned, they knew a little Spanish and my Spanish, I, you know. But I can't say that we had, I was able to have like real conversations with them about their culture or their religion or their philosophy. So I didn't really yeah. learn as much as I might have. In that regard, but one thing that I do remember very clearly, and not just from the native people, but even from, you know, the 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 Central American and and South American people, both the, you know, which is largely, I mean, some countries have more indigenous population than others. Uh, Peru, for one, is about half the country is still pure indigenous, yeah. but a lot of the population in yeah. in Latin America is is mestizo, right? A mixture of the indigenous peoples and the Spanish mm-hmm. Spaniards that came. Um, until you get way south, Argentina and Chile, it was a lot of immigration of Germans and Italians as well. But in Central America, Northern South America, it's mostly the, the Spanish influence. Um, and so, but anyway, among all those cultures, I found people, even the ordinary person on the street, you know, the, the working class person, the bus driver, the, could be so much more politically aware than the culture I came from. Yeah. You know, America back then, I still do a degree, not nearly as bad, but back in the 50s and 60s, was so um, isolated in the sense that it's such a big country that people grow up thinking, well, we don't need anything else. I don't need to learn another language. You know, we just think America is the whole world, right? And so it was a very kind mm-hmm. of, yeah. in some sense, in, in a global sense, very parochial, really. And uh, and suddenly I get out mm-hmm. there and I see that the average person on the street is much more politically aware and much more understands uh, political issues much more clearly and much more aware of all the kind of limiting structures and, and oppressions and, and systemic oppression and structural violence built into so many things. And of course, a lot of these countries were under dictatorships. Yeah. And so that it was a, a, even a further, I had already had that political awakening in my own country, you know, being part of the anti-war movement and, mm-hmm. and just a frustration with all that. But then in South in Central and South America, I really had more of a, of a, of a political e- education as well. That was a big uh, part of my travels down there and my awakening. Unfortunately, I was still caught up in this kind of us versus them kind of limited dualistic view of yeah. all that. And it wasn't until I was able to get deeper into my practice um, that I began to really move beyond that because all the great spiritual teachings uh, point us towards justice, but away from dualism. So how do you how do you approach, you know, yes. bringing about social change and and, uh, you know, positive social progress, but not from a blame and shame based dualistic perspective, but from a more contemplative wisdom based approach. And so I fortunately, you know, my my spiritual path as it developed and I got more into meditation and and different things, uh, as well as some of the experiences I had on plant medicine of various kind in South America, mm-hmm. where I had these powerful experiences of the interconnectedness and oneness of all things, even the what we think of as the inanimate world really experiencing the earth and everything is alive and interconnected and, and that quality of what Thich Nhat Hanh calls inner being. So all those various experiences led to me gradually moving beyond this kind of us versus them thinking. And uh, but but still, you know, having had this political awakening, you know, having a much larger view than most people in America had at that time. 
let, walk me through as to when meditation, because one of my, I have a good friend of mine, Jonathan DePorto, that his uh, piece that he deals with is uh, the plant experience that he assists with people to, to move through their, their trauma and so forth with him. And I just had lunch with him a few days ago. And, um, his, uh, model is that aspect of it. Talk to me as to when did you get into the meditation parts as far as the spirituality? Because to me, um, that's when I started to change, Doc, when I went into my madness as well, was when I started incorporating the meditations and as i began to um, get deeper and serious more serious about my personal development and so forth it was the meditation that ushered me into it uh, whereby i was able to then learn how to control my thoughts and how to walk with those things how to dance with it how to set my day in my space of meditation in the morning before i even move and start doing my things when did you start incorporating? Was that before you got incarcerated or after you got incarcerated? No, it was definitely before. Um, so okay, I first uh, was introduced to Eastern religions actually as a sophomore in high school in a comparative religion class. I went to a Jesuit prep school. Wow. Um, good education of Jesuits are good educators, and, and they kind of moved mm -hmm. me beyond that yes. catechismal uh, kind of understanding. They'd rather you graduate a, uh, a thinking agnostic than just someone with a childhood kind of theology, right? Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. it was good education. At any rate, the first time I read any kind of Eastern text, uh, in particular the Buddhist text, it was the first time I read anything that really made sense to me. It just, I thought, oh my, you know, I just felt at home. And then pretty soon after that, I read a yeah. book called Zen and the Art of Archery by, uh, a German man named Herigl who, encountered the, the practice of Kudo, Zen archery, uh, uh, probably in the 50s over in Japan. And, and it was working with his master was and learning that art. It was basically a deconstruction of his ego. And so, I, you know, I started reading more things, started reading D.T. Suzuki, started listening to Alan Watts. And I knew that was my, my mindset. That was my worldview. It was, I, it was what I was aligned with. I didn't actually start practicing meditation mm -hmm. yet until I was down in South America, living way up in the mountains in Peru. Uh, in a small valley off the sacred valley of the Incas in an area called Yanawar at a small little farm. And I had a little book that I brought with me. I, I kind of zeroed in on Tibetan Buddhist tradition somehow, and I found a few books. There weren't many books published back then. But one book I had with me was actually a Taoist book. It was called The Secret of the Golden Flower, little thin Taoist book on meditation. The forward by, was by Carl Jung. So, um, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so it actually had some actual practices in it. And I, I, you know, I lived in this adobe, little adobe house. I had a buddy and we, we had this little farm and it was a two room adobe house and it was a loft. So he had one side of the loft, I had the other. And, and, uh, and I'd sit up there in the morning and try to practice meditation on my own, just out of this, trying to figure it out out of the book. And, uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, during the, you know, the next year, year and a half, um, in, in there in South America, I was trying to practice, but you know, I was struggling with it. I, I'd, I'd get into it for a while. Yeah. Uh, then I'd forget. And you know, so I, I wasn't having great results and I knew I needed more support. I needed more teaching. And then, um, yeah. uh, there was, uh, uh, I actually ended up going, um, back to the U.S. I ran out of money. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, managed to do a, my first ever, uh, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. I did, I didn't, I didn't do any smuggling at that point. I came back to this. I actually got a job. I worked in the shipyards up in Oregon for uh, about nine, 10 mm -hmm. months and saved enough money to go back down there. And so a lot of people I've been hanging with had disappeared. They'd gone on with, uh, they'd met some teacher, gone on to Mexico, some to Canada, but I knew I had to stay there. That was my place. And, and there, uh, uh, some travelers came up to the place where I was living. Uh, again, in a different valley off the sacred valley of the Incas. And, uh, you know, we were in a very mm -hmm. remote area, but sometimes people would just find us and they showed up and stayed with us a couple of days. And they had with them a copy of Rolling Stone magazine from the fall of 1974. And in that mm -hmm. issue, there was this big feature story about the founding of then Naropa Institute, which later became Naropa University by the Tibetan master Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. 
And when I saw that, and started reading it, it was just like, oh my God, you know, I just knew I had to go there. And, you know, it was a whole thing that first summer, they, they expected to have a couple hundred people show up for these two summer sessions, the inaugural sessions of that institute. And they ended up getting 1,500 yeah. people in each session. It was a huge spiritual happening. It was like the spiritual Woodstock in 1974. And, you know, Baba Ramdas was there teaching as well. And, and people like Buckminster Fuller was there, William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg. It was this huge avant-garde happening and wow. spiritual happening. And But it was really Trunk Rumche that caught my attention. I saw his name and I just knew I had to go there. And I, as I said, I'd kind of zeroed in on the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, reading the few books that were available then about the life of Milarepa and the life of Padmasambhava and so forth. And I didn't even realize that he was actually of the very same lineage I was studying. But I just, it was like a beacon yeah. hit me. I just had to go there. So I managed to get up to the States and check out Naropa and decided I wanted to go do the Masters in Buddhist and Western Psychology program, not because I really intended to become a psychologist, but because of all their programs that had the most focus on meditation practice. And so eventually mm -hmm. I was able to get up there. Initially, I, I came up there with my Peruvian wife. Our son was born in Colorado. He had a heart condition, which delayed me for a year while I was working and just supporting my family and getting him the treatment he needed. But eventually I was able to enroll at Naropa University in 1977. And uh, I did this three-year, very deep clinical training program that's now called a Master's in Contemplative Psychotherapy. And uh, I did that programming and got very deeply into practice, did a lot of retreats, and that became my, my Buddhist training. And, and, I, and I did that um, really for about 10 years before I ended up in prison. So... Actually, by the time I got to prison, I, I was well developed in my practice and uh, been trained as a teacher. But at the same time, I saw all this shadow stuff going on. In fact, I was living this kind of split life. I was spending like half the year either traveling yeah. with my teacher or who I'd become very close to or, or you know, on meditation retreats, lead, leading a disciplined lifestyle. And the other half of the year out there being this crazy you know, smuggler and cocaine <laughs> cowboy, you know, and I, and I, and I self-medicated <laughs> around the cognitive dissonance with that, you know, which came up mostly when yeah. I was out doing the craziness. And, um, so, uh, that all went on and, and I knew I had to get out of that. I knew I had to leave the, the drugs behind and all that. But before I managed to extricate myself, I ended up earning my way into a long federal prison sentence. Yeah, um, listening to your lifestyle and, and mine was similar. I remember going to, I spent some time in an ashram and I'd be partying, uh, doing lines and stuff like that and then going to the ashram the next day and stuff like that. I had followed, um, you know, I was actually in Boulder, Colorado and I went to the university and hung out. I read a lot of his stuff, um, way before I even got to, um, Colorado and, uh, it was really, for me, it, it resonated within me, his teaching. And I had followed, um, his teaching really funny. I was following him, his teaching doc when I was going through similar situation like you. I was, I had this dual lifestyle that I was still trying to find my way, but mm -hmm. I was very fascinated with much of his work. I was reading everything I can about him and, his uh, teachings and the meditation, all of that stuff, while I was still working things out, as you stated. So you were here, you got in um, your situation, and you're incarcerated. A great place to learn. Talk to me about some of how did you utilize the time there um, after you've gotten all of these um, uh, uh I want to say exposure to the spiritual aspect of it. How did you utilize that time there now with that knowledge? Yeah, well, that was really the turning point in my life, obviously. I mean, meeting Trung Krumche was a huge turning point, and he gave me the blessing, the kind of father-son blessing that blessed my father's heart. He just, We just didn't connect for him to do that. It was the generational yeah. you know, confusion and everything else, and he was a good man, but I never received that confirmation from him, and I did, and I had a hard time receiving it from 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 I mean, and I was very lucky to end up having a very personal relation with with him. And sometimes he would just shake me and hold me and say, "You have to let something in. You have, you know." And uh, um, hmm. so I did receive that, but I was still, you know, dealing with all my confusion and everything. And when I got when I when I got locked up in prison, that was the huge wake up 
Um, a huge part of it was my son was yeah. nine years old at the time, and I now had to face that even though I'd always thought I, I would love my son, that actually I'd been an incredibly selfish person, constantly putting my son's life at risk, his mother's life at risk, and that now is, he was going to grow up without a dad. I got originally sentenced to a 30-year no parole sentence. The day I got sentenced, I was facing wow. life without parole, and if I'd gotten that, I would still be there. And uh, I couldn't sleep the night before my sentencing. I was up all night long, and I was in this isolation cell in a county jail. And I, I literally didn't sleep the whole night. And I remember not long before dawn, I, I, I just had this urge to get out of the claustrophobia of my cell. And there was a small window up high, and I stood up on this stainless steel toilet that was built into the cell and looked out. I could just see a bit of the night sky and the stars. And something came over me. I sat down, sat down on the bunk in that cell. And I just had this absolute clarity that I wasn't going to give up. I wouldn't give up on myself. I wouldn't give up on my son. I wouldn't give up on life. Wow. I wouldn't give up on, on my path. And regardless of what happened that day, and, and uh, fortunately, I wasn't sentenced to life, but I was sentenced to 30 years with uh, parole. And uh, they, they, they still had parole. This was 1985. And there was still parole in the federal system. There hasn't been since 87. But I was sentenced before yeah. those laws. So fortunately, and I didn't realize this when I got locked up, it was it was months after I got to federal prison that I even realized how all this worked. But because I was sentenced on what they call the old law uh, before the no the parole system went away and the sentencing guidelines came into play, you still got a lot of good time back then if you stayed out of trouble. So I, I mm -hmm. eventually I realized that if I managed to stay out of trouble, I would have to serve 18 and a half years in prison. Uh, if I, if I had a parolable sentence, I would have been eligible for parole after one third of my sentence. But, but with the good time, yeah. I would serve 18 and a half years if I stayed out of trouble. When you get in trouble in prison, they just start taking away your good time in chunks. And, uh, and then mm. eventually my appeal went through the courts. It took about three years. And on appeal, they knocked off one count. My, my sentence was aggregated out of five different counts. They knocked off one, which probably should have gotten me a new trial, but it didn't. And, and uh, so anyway, my sentence was reduced from 30 to 25. I was grateful for that. And then I knew that uh, I would serve 14 and a half. And it still felt like forever, yeah. but very different than 30. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but there was a huge wake-up call on what I'd done to my son and how I'd let down my son, my family, my teacher, what I'd done to myself. I had really torched my life to the ground. And uh, so mm -hmm. that was a big turnaround, a huge wake up call, and I had to face myself and, and really see the reality of all the selfish decisions I've been making for so long, confused decisions, selfish decisions. And then also when I got mm -hmm. to the federal prison where I did my time, which is the U.S. Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in, in uh, southwest Missouri, in Springfield, Missouri, it's the maximum security federal prison hospital. There's a number of hospitals in the, in the federal prison system, but this is the maximum security one. So they bring patients there from all the federal penitentiaries, the really severe, heavy penitentiaries mm -hmm. like Lewisburg and Lompoc and uh, Atlanta and so forth, uh, and Leavenworth and so forth. And and so there were about a thousand patients there, 600 medical, 400 psychiatric, and then about 300 of what they call general population or work cadre inmates. Uh, they were just there to help run the place. Uh, I was in that group. And and so, you know, people got jobs in food service or housekeeping or hospital orderlies. And since I had an education, I got a job teaching in the prison school. And that was my day job for 14 years, was yeah. helping inmates learn to read, uh, helping my fellow prisoners get a GED, uh, helping them study for correspondent college courses. That was just my day job, Monday through Friday. Um, and But when I first got, I'll never forget when I first got that, I'd been in this hellhole of a county jail for seven months going through trial and sentencing. They never granted me bail. And so, um, you know, incredibly, just a hellhole of a place. So I get to this big federal prison, and it was a relief because I could walk around. There were like 10 buildings. They're all connected by these half underground tunnels, and you could walk around. There was a prison yards and a big rec area and things like that. But as I'm walking around this place, it was like something out of a Fellini movie, the amount of suffering. There were people being guided around, uh, you know, blind men who were blind being guided around with, a, you know, with a white cane and somebody guiding them. Uh, men being wheeled mm -hmm. around in wheelchairs who are paraplegic or quadriplegic or emaciated from cancer and AIDS. Men coming out of the psych ward doing the, the, the Thorazine or the Hell at All two-step and out in the yard talking to trees. I mean, it was wow. just a bizarre place. But I, it, it wasn't that it, uh, I connected with the bizarreness of it. I connected with the suffering of it. It just completely woke me up. Yeah. As I arrived there, you can imagine I was really caught up in the drama of my own situation. I'd just gotten this 30-year-old post yeah, on yeah. It said the next day I'd be 65, I was 35, it said I'd be 65 before I have any cancer released. 
I was all caught up in my own drama. And then I get to this place and it just completely woke me up. And with the influence of my family and my mm-hmm. spiritual teacher, I realized I was here to show up and serve and, and try to bring, you know, yeah. some compassion and, and, and help to this place in any way I could. And it was like my teacher was just kind of right there on my shoulder because my teacher, uh, you know, he, today he's considered controversial for all kinds of reasons. Uh, um, but he was, you know, a genuine siddha, a genuine awakened being. All of his contemporaries in the Tibetan Buddhist teach and recognize him as such. But he was also working with healing the mm-hmm. demons of Western culture, and and you know, uh, yeah. anyways, controversial teacher and incredible avant-garde artist, and and all kind all kinds of things. But the bedrock of who he was, in my experience, and I was with him a lot and watched him very closely, was I never saw him have any other agenda than helping humanity and helping people wake up twenty four seven. And so I had that influence, mm. and so. So that really woke me up out of my own personal drama, and I really set forth a path. I also wanted, I was desperate to leave my son a better legacy than just his dad went to prison, or even his dad died in prison, because I had no surety that I would survive prison. I mean, people were dying all around me, uh, in some cases from violence yeah. in the prison, but in, in but in most cases from all kinds of illness, cancer, liver disease, AIDS. This was the height of the AIDS epidemic. And, uh, and people who were even in the general population, I saw get, get sick and die there. So I had no surety that I'd survive my time. And I wanted to do something with my life that would leave a better legacy for my son than just his dad went to prison or died in prison. So I, I was just, I was like fueled with this kind of rocket fuel to get all the negativity out of my life and take all the good I've received and yeah. focus it both in my own transformation and being able to do some good and add value to this community that I was now part of. And so mm-hmm. that was my journey for 14 years. I lived as a, a very disciplined prison monk. I actually took monastic vows. And uh, my life was focused on study and practice and service. And, I, you know, I kept myself in good shape. I was very healthy. Um, but my life was, you know, very disciplined from like, you know, 5.30 in the morning to um, I didn't sleep much, especially the first eight years. I, I was sleeping like four, four and a half hours a night uh, disciplining myself. I would have mm-hmm. liked to have slept more. And I don't know how I did. I couldn't get away with that today, but then I would. And, uh, you know, because mm-hmm. I stayed up very late. Uh, you know, we we're all locked in, in our unit by nine o'clock and then they had lights out at 1030. But I'd be studying for several hours and then practicing meditation for several hours yeah. and sometimes be up till midnight or one. And then I'd get up again at 530 and start practicing in the morning before breakfast. And I just led this very disciplined wow. life of service and practice and and uh, this was on fire with that, uh, the whole 14 years that I was in prison. Now, I, I'm listening to your story, Doc, and um, there are a couple of things I tell people that I've noticed uh, why people are stuck. And you mentioned two, um, two uh, times in your, in your conversation, two gifts that I always say to people. Um, Until you get these, you don't know how to move. And I call them statement of faith, Doc. The reason why I call them statement of faith, you as an individual, you believe that entrance once that light comes in stronger than anything else. And you had one when you got in there and you realized, I have been selfish. And you then, once that thing lodged within your spirit, I always say to people, that once it's lodged, it will cause you to do the corresponding actions to bring whatever you, that statement that you confess within yourself to bring it to pass. And the other was when you had that opportunity, when you were walking and you were brought there and you saw the suffering and you made a statement within yourself. I see, now I understand why I'm here. And that caused you... um as you were saying, the story it caused you to begin to do the corresponding actions that you felt at the time and you perceived that was at the time. And that was you only lived on four hours of sleep and so forth. And you did your practicing. You were doing all of those things. At that time, that's what seemed the road that you should take. And a lot of people, Doc, they're stuck in life because they haven't had that experience yet. They don't know. And they're just drifting all over the place. And I was that way. And you were that way until you got that visitation while you were sitting there and you saw, wait a minute, I was selfish. I need to do something. 
wait a minute, I'm looking at some suffering. I need to do something. So as you are learning and you're moving forward now, because this is a powerful story uh, that you're talking about. It's uh, uh, a journey of a man that has been through much. You started um, in the 60s, that tumultuous time and, and walking through that and all of those different things and those experiences. And this is good stuff. I love this. Um, talk to me, Doc, as now, how did you manage to move from the incarceration aspect of your life and come back into society. How was that um, created and how did you, how did it manifest? Yeah, Ken, well, to give that context, I'd like to talk about four things that were really powerfully transformative for me in my prison journey. The first was what, yes, what you already mentioned, that I had that recognition of the very harmful behavior I'd been involved in. Uh, and, you know, I mm -hmm. got involved in 12-step work, realizing I had my own substance abuse issues to deal with. So I was very active in the 12-step work, AA and NA, the whole time I was there. And so the first year of listening to one man after another tell the story of their life unraveling around cocaine in particular, I couldn't justify my involvement in that anymore at all and, and realize I had been involved mm -hmm. in something very harmful on top of the fact of what I'd done to my son and so forth. So I developed this profound desire to just not cause any more harm. And I was doing contemplative practices yeah. in my Buddhist tradition, really about reinforcing that profound longing to just not cause any more harm. Though, of course, to try to do good, but, but fundamentally to at least not cause any more harm. That become like a passionate longing. And I was so acutely aware of having been involved in, in harmful behavior. So that was one thing. The other thing yeah. was being involved in the 12-step movement and early on struggling with the kind of, you know, both the, 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 the AA path arose in a kind of Christian context and the language tends to be dualistic and Christian. nothing wrong with that tradition. I really value all the spiritual tradition today, but I was struggling with it as a Buddhist. And, and I, at some point I decided to just stop struggling and just let, let it be, you know, let, let all that stuff jumble around me, however it would. But I also realized that that, that notion of a, of a higher power, which I was kind of struggling with in, in, you know, the language of the AA movement, uh, I realized that that hole in my gut was my higher power, that that's where I had to go. That hole in my gut was absolutely mm -hmm. where I had to go. And I focused my practice and my awareness on dealing with that. And and, and it, all my life, it had been like this terrifying black hole that I felt would, would mean annihilation if I really went there. And, and it was actually my yeah. healing the minute, you know, once I started really relating with that and using the 12 step work plus my meditation practices and other practices of the Buddhist tradition. That's what really led to that, to the healing. And that hole is not there anymore. It hasn't been there for a long time. Yeah. You know, and that was causing me to have this really addictive, compulsive, confused relationship with life, trying to, trying to ease that pain or fill that hole with something. So that hole healed through that path. Yeah. Another part of it was wow. the service work I got involved in. I was involved in a lot of service work, but in particular, we started the first hospice program in a prison anywhere in the world in 1987 and this is the wow. heights of the AIDS, AIDS epidemic they were bringing all the AIDS patients from the federal system there and they were dying in horrific conditions this was before the proteus inhibitors and they were getting every opportunity wow. infection you could imagine yeah. and there was no there was almost no pain management and and people were dying of bone cancer and, and being given Tylenol right so people were dying of liver disease and heart disease and cancer and especially AIDS and so with another inmate and the support of a prison psychologist and a prison chaplain, we started the first hospice program. And for the last 11 years of my 14 years there, uh, that's what I did on my meal breaks and a lot of my evenings and a lot of my weekend time. I was up in the hospital caring for men who were dying and really befriending them. And wow. I usually had two patients at a time and, and uh, we would stick with our patient. Once we were assigned to our patient, we would stick with them throughout the course of their illness and, and very few uh, managed to get a, uh, you know, a release before they died or got a compassion release. Most died there. And I was with about half of my, I think I worked with about 41, 42 patients over that time. And I was probably with about half of them at the moment of their death. So that was one of the, some of the most transformative work I've ever been involved in because, you know, really set your own stuff aside to really focus on someone else's stuff yeah, and be yeah. there for them. It's incredibly transformative you know i'll just tell really quickly one of my patients early on a man named lyle we had so much in common we've both been iv drug users we've both been drug smugglers we've both been involved in airplane stuff and we both had a son who was nine years old well by then about 
11. And, uh, he had a daughter as well. But, you know, and, and he was interested in Buddhism. He'd never really gotten directly involved too much, but he read lots of books, including Kung Fu Mshe. But his real pain, he was a beautiful man who never complained about his illness, didn't, was kind to the staff. A lot of patients take their, you know, the, all their pain and suffering out on the staff. He was always kind to everyone, but mm-hmm. his pain was about his kids. And when he would sit there and talk about, share this wow. pain and be in tears and agony about his son and, and his daughter, you know, you can imagine what was going on for me, bringing up all my pain. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and also, I had never been tested for AIDS yet. And I knew very well I could have AIDS, you know, uh, with the lifestyle I'd led. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, it brought up so much. And I, I learned how to be informed by all that and be with my own experience while not being in my own experience, instead being there for somebody else. And it was profound training. Yes. Um, and just so, so that was some of the most transformative things. And then the other part of it was just going deep, deep into my practice. I was very fortunate to continue to receive empowerments from the Tibetan teachers in my lineage and go deep into the inner yogic practices. So all these things, well, and then the one last thing I want to mention, because this is really the heart of my book, Radical Responsibility. No. When I first arrived in prison, I just immediately grokked the world I was in. It was a world of tremendous anger and bitterness and violence and negativity. And everybody had a huge victim story. Right. And when you'd meet a prisoner, the first thing you do, you walk the track and exchange your victim stories. And after I did that once or twice, I didn't want to do that anymore. I was I didn't want to hear anybody else's story, which mm-hmm. wasn't very compassionate, but I really didn't want to hear my story. And I realized that if I wasn't very proactive, I'd come out of prison angry, bitter with a big victim story. And I just realized that that was, you know, that wasn't where I wanted to. I didn't want to live that way in prison. And so I realized very quickly yeah. that I had the only way through and out and beyond prison for me was to take 200% responsibility for having got myself in there and what I was going to do with it. And I had all kinds of people I could have blamed for. Well, there's all kinds of people stuck me in the back. When the when the government prosecutes you, they break all the laws and rules. They play hardball. And a lot, yeah. I did a lot of people's time. I probably did 30 or 40 people's time who testified and didn't go to prison because they testified against me. So, you know, I could have focused mm-hmm. on all that, but I made a clear decision not to do that and just focus on you know, take total ownership for having got myself there, what I was going to do with it, and what kind of life I could create for myself going forward. And that was really the birth of the Radical Responsibility Program and that's a model. And that's actually what allowed me to do things like create two national organizations while I was in prison and two national movements, the prison Dharma movement and, and the prison hospice movement. So when I came out of prison in 1999, I had no chip on my shoulder. I was completely healed. I had trained myself. And uh, I've had nothing but opportunity ever since I got out. I mean, the first six months were rough because I was in a halfway house and on and on close supervision. And, and you know, they, it, it's all set up to make you fail. And I was lucky. I, I could have yeah. ended up being sent back to prison, not for being and doing anything wrong, but just not being able to, to stay on track all the crazy rules and all the reporting stuff and everything. But fortunately, I survived it. But I've had nothing but opportunity uh, uh, for the now 23, 24 years that I've been out of prison. Uh, but it was really through the process of spending 14 years healing myself and training myself mm-hmm. in how to serve and how to be in the world and how to be of use to others. I think um, I, I mentioned, I've always said this to the, to, these, to the folks that I listen and, and I talk to, personal growth, the journey of personal growth is designed for you to take ownership. If you are not able to take ownership, you will not be able to embark on that journey because it is a space by which you look into yourself. You go into the, those dark places that are there because uh, that you have, you and I have uh, put together um, to, I guess, to manage our life. And then we have to go in there and start di- dismantling a lot of things that were deposited in us to then create, I say to them, we are creators, to create this new world, this new system that we want to embark and live from. So I want you to talk to me because it's important not that um, from that space that you learned, and that's some tremendous, powerful lessons um, to be uh, there every day, every day, and see the transition even from life to death and and the breath, the movement of all those things that you were exposed and you're now creating your, as I stated earlier, 
policies and procedures. Talk to me about some of those. I know you mentioned, I don't want you to go in all of them, but I want you to mention some of them because those that are listening, you've got to buy this book um, because it'll, it'll usher you into the space of uh, ownership. Talk to them, Doc, about some of those policies and principles by which you recognize and saw and say, wait a minute, I need to incorporate this into my life so that I can move from one space to the other. Yeah, happy to. So, you know, the book starts with the context of what my Tibetan teacher called basic goodness, unconditional innate, unconditional goodness, that we are all unconditionally good as human beings, all of life. And which is contrary to the view of, uh, you know, the flawed nature of humanity, which I think is un, un, unfortunately a, a misperception of, of the true Christian tradition. And uh, and we've all gotten tremendous, you know, I mean, in some ways, the human condition is a setup because we start off in a very fragile circumstance. And eventually we have to separate from the mother and we start putting together some kind of self-structure. And it's basically fear based because it's based on mm-hmm. wanting to survive. Yep. And uh, and we're really challenged, and we build our self structure on whatever's around. And if we have really level, safe, loving, stable uh, childhood environment, our se- our self structure is better formed. But it's still fear based, essentially. And uh, of course, for a lot of us, our childhoods were a mixed bag at best, and so we have a lot of holes and yeah. fractures in our self structure, and we do things like therapy and so forth to repair that. But we all start off, that's kind of the human condition. And then plus, we've been getting messages of unworthiness our whole life from various religious traditions, but also Uh the consumerist culture. The basic message is you're not enough, you're not okay, but if you buy this, you just might be okay until the next Mm -hmm. version of the product comes out, right? So we've been bombarded with us that our whole lives. And so doing the work, the contemplative work to not, I mean, if you can take on the faith of basic goodness, that's wonderful. But if you can actually have through various contemplative practices available in various traditions, including secular traditions, find a way to drop into the depth of our being, blow all the noise into the depth of our being. We can actually experience that level in our being where it's unmistakable that we're not broken, that we don't need fixing, that we are unconditionally good, pure and whole. So having some experience, I think, is foundational. So that's where the radical responsibility book starts out. And then the next is about having a practice. So that chapter two is all about developing some kind of self-reflection, self-awareness, mindfulness practice so that we can actually have a chance to see what's going on. Otherwise, like we're going through life with blinders on, right? So having that Mm self-awareness and environmental awareness and to be able to learn, right? So we need a practice. We need to be able to train our mind to spend more and more of our life awake and in a self-reflective, aware state. And that's how we really learn. And then the third chapter is on emotional intelligence to really begin to understand, you know, how all our emotions and work and the whole cognitive emotional landscape. Uh, so that's kind of the ground of the whole thing. And, you know, I like uh, Tony Robbins, who's inspired a lot of people. He often says, you know, you don't need to be kind of a PhD in psychology, but he, I want the, you know, he wants the people he trains to become practical psychologists. They have a, what he means by that is have enough yes. knowledge about how your own psychology works, how your own body, mind, psyche psychology the whole thing works so so you're not ruled by it so you can actually get in the driver's seat yeah. of your own life so a lot of the path of radical responsibility has to do with you know understanding at least the basics of neuroscience and the basics of habit formation and the basics of science of how to change habits and it's also very much grounded in understanding how drama and human conflict arises i work a lot with stephen carbon's drama triangle and how to get off the drama triangle out of that victim persecutor rescuer dynamic uh, that just fuels constant mm-hmm. drama in our personal lives and families and constant war and destruction all around the world. So a lot of, you know, really getting in not only just desire, you know, you can say radical responsibility, certainly in the realm of books around radical ownership and, and there's some degree, you know, mental toughness, stoicism, like things like that. But it, it's not just a should, it really goes into the science of how do you develop the capacity to get out of the victim mindset and get in back into the driver's seat of your own life, to have the skills and awareness and actually to rewire your own brain in a process to do so. But to do all of that within a context of tremendous self-compassion and then developing the capacity yes. to have, you know, boundless compassion for all beings and experience that profound interconnectedness with all of life. So it's a very much a training. It's, it's taking ownership for the fact that as human, the human condition unexamined, is a setup for leaving a, a life of suffering and ignorance where we're where we're just 
imprisoned by our own desires and wants and confused programming and faulty wiring and all the rest of it. And we're really living unconsciously in a space between our childhood conditioning that we had no choice in what we got and the world around us. And we're just in there getting pushed around, right? Until we decide to, uh, to awaken yes. and start taking responsibility for it. Well, that same human condition, once we are willing to examine it, is the vehicle for our awakening. So there's nothing wrong with the human condition. It just is the human challenge. And once we start examining it and learning and doing the work to become conscious, then, you know, there's just this glorious, never-ending journey of becoming more awake and more conscious, having greater capacity to serve in life. Uh, and from that, that deep uh, experience of not only our own innate goodness, everyone else's innate goodness, but also our profound interconnectedness with each other in all of life. So, you know, that's what the path is about taking ownership or taking that journey. Now, Radical Responsibility, the book, is really about the journey of personal ownership, radical ownership. And the key distinction is the distinction between ownership and blame. This had nothing to do with blaming yeah. others, obviously, but it has not one iota to do with blaming ourselves, and it has not one iota to do with blaming victims. It's about getting out of the blame paradigm altogether into ownership. And when we look to really examine our own, you know, contribution to the situations we've ended up in life that we're not so happy about, that's not for the purpose of blaming ourselves at all. It's simply for learning because if I can learn how I got from point A to mm -hmm. point B, next time I can make diff different decisions and get to a different point, right? So it's all about owning our own process of learning. But my second book and the Radical Responsibility Model is really meant to be about the intersection and the integration of personal responsibility and collective responsibility. And my second book is going to be much yeah. more about collective responsibility because I believe we are a brother's keeper, but we're also responsible for ourselves. And, you know, how do we bring those yeah. together? Because as we all know, you know, the incredible divisiveness of our world politically and culturally today, the left tends to be all about it's all causes and conditions. They don't want to hear anything about personal responsibility. The right is all about personal responsibility. They don't want to hear anything about causes and conditions. Neither one will give an answer. It gets more and more polarized all the time. And any rational person knows it's both. I mean, to create social change, the kind of social change we all want, requires personally responsible people doing it. You know, people who haven't embraced personal mm -hmm. responsibility, when they get out and try to create social change, they just replicate their own confusion and they use strategies of blaming and shaming. And it just keeps the whole drama unfolding. So, you know, I always want to make that point that even though I really start with the ground of personal responsibility, self-ownership, self-leadership, it's in service of then working with everyone else to create a better future for everybody and create a, a society that's more fair and, and gives everybody uh, the kind of opportunities we'd all like to have to move forward in our lives. So I'm looking forward to get that second book out because then it's going to, you know, really show people that integration that you can have personal responsibility and collective responsibility as an integrated path. I think it is the answer to our current situation that we we're walking as human beings uh, enjoying this uh, experience, I think it is a marriage of both. I, I don't see how it could not be, you know, but um, again, uh, but uh, we've been talking for about an hour or so, Doc, and I can go on for another hour because you have uh, laid out um, and your story is so rich with the breadcrumbs that one can um, pick up and have this loaf of bread that they can feed themselves for years uh, that is powerful i everyone that has been listening to us i encourage that you get into doc's space get in touch with him purchase his books um, get into his um, uh, on his facebook's his social media wherever he is and i will provide those things for you so that you can have access to him because with him houses much wisdom and I'm sure that he would not mind having you there and I always tell uh, people this doc when they purchase a, a book from someone that they are getting a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person you are uh, the same power uh, that he or she that is speaking to you and verbally that you can hear it is the same power and energy that are in those pages and you're listening to them speak to you personally purchase the book and we'll wait for the second one doc i know you have another one out there uh, that uh, chronicles 
your meditation, your teaching, and your journey when you were there incarcerated. Um, but I tell everyone, get into his space, podcast, books, blog, anything you can, because this man is here for you and I so that we can gain from him the wisdom and the knowledge that is housed within him. Doc, thank you so much for coming to the Threads of Enlightenment. This has been just beautiful for me. Thank you very much, Ken. I really enjoyed the conversation. You're a great interviewer, some great questions, and I just enjoyed taking this journey with you and connecting. I'll feel this this uh, real uh, genuine uh, connection with you and our mutual experiences and journeys. And, you know, we're, you know, who knows why each of us is presented with the opportunities and the challenges we are, but, you know, the fact the journeys we take are meant to be for everyone. And so, uh, you know, uh, again, Tony Robbins likes to say success, however we define success, whether that's success out in the world or just, just personal evolution or having whatever it is, but success leaves breadcrumbs. I love you. You talked about the breadcrumbs, right? We can, by, by reading, I, yes. I'm constantly reading books. I'm constantly studying with other Me people too. and I still have my own personal uh, uh, spiritual teachers, but I, I read and study and expose myself to everything I can constantly because, you know, that, that, that that's how we learn and that's how we progress along our path. And uh, yeah. so I just really appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation with you today and to meet your audience. Thank you so much. I love what you said. I read a lot uh, because, you know, it's Doc, I, I'm so excited about finding out more about myself makes me read and read and read i just want to know and i think that we are so deep that we will be reading for the rest of our lifetime and and uh um getting to know who we are we are such a precious and deep uh um entity on this planet it's, it's just amazing that people for me that people don't want to take this journey it is the most beautiful space to be and to live from and as you are today i tell people the um, one of the biggest prize that an individual ever have is to become a servant. It is one of the most powerful space. And I believe we're called to live from there, that we would serve each other, that we would serve each other through um, conversation, holding, empathy, love, all of it, that once we are serving people, Don, we behave differently. You would not... You're not looking at uh, taking something from them. You're looking at offering something to them. And I believe that when we are in that space, we are able to be in this space of peace because when you receive it, it is un unexpected and it's it creates a joyful feeling. But if you're coming in there expecting, that means that if you don't get what you're expecting, you are going to behave differently towards that person because you feel that that expectation hasn't been met. But don't come expecting. Come with your arms open, offering. And when you when you receive something, your joy will be full. And I encourage everyone to come and walk with us, man. This is some beautiful stuff. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, sir.